is called Summer of Love in honor of the 55th anniversary of Woodstock. So we've been hearing about loving God and loving our enemies. And last week, Pastor Jeffrey Richards preached about loving ourselves because the Shema says, love our neighbors as ourselves. And if we don't love ourselves, how can we love our neighbors? Today, we're talking about loving play and how it can save the day. I don't know about you, but I don't often think of God as playful. I mean, God's serious, right? How could God possibly be playful and joyful when there's so much suffering and brokenness in our world? Doesn't being playful in times like these seem almost frivolous? Or is it at times like these that joyful play is even more essential? Scripture says that when King David's wife, Michael, berated him for making a fool of himself by leaping and dancing in front of the ark of the Lord, well, unconfirmed sources say that she compared him that day to Olympic breaker Rega, the Aussie coach, the Aussie college professor who delighted people in the breaking competition this year. David countered her by saying it seemed like exactly the right thing to do, considering all that God had done for him. Therefore, I will play before the Lord, he told his sneering wife. Listen now to the word of God from the Hebrew scripture, 2 Samuel. It was reported to King David that God had prospered Obed, Edom, and his entire household because of the ark of God. So David thought, I'll get that blessing for myself, and went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David, celebrating extravagantly all the way. David, ceremonially dressed in priest linen, danced with great abandon before God. The whole country was with him as he accompanied the ark of God with shouts and trumpet blasts. But as the ark of God came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, happened to be looking out the window. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before God, her heart filled with scorn. They brought the Ark of God and set it in the middle of the tent pavilion that David had pitched for it. Then and there David worshiped, offering burnt offerings and peace offerings. Then everyone went home. David returned home to bless his family. Michael, Saul's daughter, came out to greet him. How wonderfully the king has distinguished himself today, she said, exposing himself to the eyes of the servants' maids like some burlesque street dancer. David replied to Michael, In God's presence, I'll dance all I want. God chose me over your father and the rest of our family and made me prince over God's people over Israel. Oh yes, I'll dance to God's glory more recklessly even than this. This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. In the Hebrew scriptures in Psalm 104, the psalmist praises God for all of creation, including the great and white sea in which are creeping things without number, animals both great and small. And the psalmist makes special mention of Leviathan, the sea creature that we know as the whale, which the psalmist says God has made to play in the sea. If you happen to watch the Olympic surfing semifinal match in Tahiti last week, you might have seen a whale sporting right along with those surfers. So David, the dancing king, Avoiding whales, they're not accomplishing much of anything. There's nothing educational or helpful in what they're doing. Nothing you'd likely say was religious. They're not thinking great thoughts. They're just playing. They're letting go and having a marvelous time of it. King David with sweat pouring down his face. His eyes are sparkling. The whale has just shot a 30-foot spout into the air and is getting ready to heave his entire 150 tons into the air right after it. Does 
this mean that their creator God is playful too? Perhaps. Why did God create a world that routinely delights people with fantastic sunsets, beautiful sunrises, and stunning scenery? Why did God make giraffe's neck so long and Doc's his leg so short? Why did God create such a magnificent array of lovely birds and butterflies? And what about the platypus and puppies? I can only conclude that God wants us to enjoy creation, to play in it, to laugh. For play is about joy, sheer joy. The joy in the Bible talks about is a river, like the Sacramento or the American, that runs deep in the human soul connects us to the very essence of life, to God, and to who God created us to be. Now, even though the river's there all the time, it's possible for it to get clouded up by life. Life. We know it can be hard. We've all been there, overworked, stressed, mentally and physically burned out. Day in and day out, Maybe you feel like you hit the wall, dragging through the day, exhausted even when you first wake up. Normally, when we feel like that, we reach for a quick fix, like coffee, or energy drinks, or eating donuts, or chocolate, or eating chocolate donuts. But after they wear off, our energy levels crash, leaving us even more exhausted than before. Maybe it's the pressures of life weighing us down, taking care of kids or grandkids or parents, or doing our jobs or a lot of things that are all good things, but over time they can wear us down. Lots of us tend to focus so much on work or family commitments or volunteering that we rarely seem to have time for just having fun. Chronic pain or busyness can steal our joy. And we just go from one thing to the next to the next, day after day, year after year. The river of joy is still in there somewhere, but it's clouded up by chronic busyness. So how do we get back in touch with joy? One way might be through play. Playing gives your body back the energy it needs through laughter, doing things that bring you joy, and being with other people who are having fun helps raise your energy level, and it makes you feel more alive. Someone once said, the true object of all human life is play. Earth is a task garden. Heaven is a playground. Play is a way we can relieve stress and make connections with others. Play renews and recenters us. It taps into our creativity and helps transform our negative emotions. It's something we do for the sheer love of a particular activity. Playing a game, going dancing, enjoying a dinner party with friends on the patio, going hiking can all be wonderful, playful pursuits. How you play is up to you. Just try to make sure that you don't turn your play into more work. I love going swimming, but when I focus only on how many laps I'm doing, that becomes like more work. But when I have an underwater tea party with my daughters, that's play. I run through Garcia Bend Park most mornings to get to the levee by the river. And these days, there's a summer day camp in the park during the week. So I get to see children playing. Sometimes they're hitting a ball or playing tag or sitting on the grass playing cards, and they look like they're having fun. I know the young ones on the swing are having fun because they're squealing and laughing. Sometimes when I get feeling a little worn out or kind of irritable or grumpy, I ask myself, when was the last time you had fun? Have you done anything playful lately? 
and Netflix pretty much doesn't count. Last week, I saw a mood-boosting idea in a TikTok video by Trina Mertz. She calls it saving the day. She says, my friend and I came up with this thing we call saving the day. If we spend our whole day working, we do one thing that reclaims the day as our own. She says, saving the day can be any activity, and it doesn't have to take up much time. She lists examples like calling your mom, making a meal, going for a walk, making a cup of tea, or reading your favorite book. Anything that makes the day feel like you had some space in it again, she says. So I immediately thought of play. Could adding in a bit of play each day be a way of saving the day? With all the stressors in life, including the anxiety-inducing election cycle we're in, we could all use a little more calm, a little more joy, a little more playfulness. One of my favorite sayings about Presbyterians is that Presbyterians believe in life before death. Playing is a way to become more fully alive. Because when we play, we relax. And when we relax, we give ourselves permission to think about the things that make us happy to be alive. God wants us to rest regularly and enjoy life. That's what the Sabbath is all about. And playing helps relieve us of the constant grind we can get into. When we play, our problem-solving and adaptive abilities are in much better shape to handle the complexity of the world. You remember that saying, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. It first appeared in James Howe's Proverbs in 1659. They knew it way back then. It seems like James Howe was on to something. Researchers say that play helps us develop curiosity and learn to think and make new choices, discover special talents, build our relationships, and experience renewed enthusiasm for life. I wonder if God built in a sense of fun in us to complement all the troubles that God knew would come our way. And one of the wonderful things about play is that everyone can do it. Playing with your partner, your friends, coworkers, pets, and children, grandchildren, is a sure and fun way to fuel your imagination. It boosts your creativity and emotional well-being. Adult play is a time to forget about our commitments and be social in an unstructured kind of way. When I'm in the car sometimes, I like to listen to TED Talks on NPR. One afternoon, the topic was play. Host Guy Raz was exploring ideas about why we play and why we shouldn't stop playing when we grow up. And he said, if you're investigating the field of play, you pretty much have to talk to Stuart Brown. Dr. Stuart Brown is a founder and president of the National Institute of Play. The National Institute for Play funds research that explores the power of play, not just for children, but for adults too. I think that the story of how Stuart Brown became one of the top experts in the world on play is intriguing. Dr. Brown's study of play is linked to his research on the devastating consequences that happen when play is suppressed, which he based on the psychology of aggression and the crime that was perpetrated by Charles Whitman on August 1st, 1966. In 1966, Stuart Brown was a young psychiatry professor at Baylor University in Texas when Charles Whitman a former Marine sharpshooter, fired shots from the University of Texas Tower in Austin. 49 people were hit by gunfire that day. 16 died, 33 were injured. It was, at the time, the largest mass shooting in the U.S. 
Dr. Brown studied Charles Whitman's life to discover what could have led him to commit such terrible carnage. He discovered that Whitman's father was an expert at firearms with a history of domestic violence. Then Brown found out something else that was very specific about Charles's childhood. The neighbors who he interviewed after the crime and then again 20 years later had never seen little Charles Whitman engaged in what would be considered spontaneous free play. Whenever he was crawling and exploring, his father would punish him. When he was four years old, his father insisted that he start taking piano lessons. And if he didn't practice when he was four or five years old, his father would hurt him. After researching Charles Whitman, Stuart thought maybe missing out on childhood play could leave a mark, and in this case, a devastating one. But Charles Whitman was just one research subject. So Stuart Brown went to a prison the infamous Huntsville prison in Texas. And he met with 26 convicted murderers and interviewed them. And what Stewart found there in every case was the exact same story. The lack of rough and tumble play in all 26 of the young murderers. And their lack of empathy, empathy appeared to Brown to be linked. For years after studying those prisoners in Huntsville, Stewart continued to research the childhoods of people like them and Charles Whitman, and how a lack of play could have affected their developing brains. If play is missing in early development, Brown said, say from six or eight months to five years, that's really serious. But at any point in our lifetime, Play is a necessary part of shaping and developing our brains. Brown says that the opposite of play isn't work, it's depression. In the process of playing, our brains make new connections, rewire themselves, sort of like new mapping, and our mood gets lifted. But somehow, between childhood and adulthood, many of us stop playing. And when we carve out leisure time, we're more likely to zone out in front of the TV or computer than engage in fun, rejuvenating play like we did as kids. Play is an important source of relaxation and stimulation for us as adults as well as children. It could be goofing off with friends or sharing jokes with a coworker, throwing a frisbee on the beach, dressing up at Halloween with your kids, Building a snowman, well, you have to go to Tahoe to do that. Doing a puzzle, playing fetch with a dog, playing video games, acting out charades at a party, or going for a walk or a bike ride with no destination in mind. There doesn't need to be any point to the activity besides just enjoying yourself. When we give ourselves permission to play with that joyful abandon of childhood, we reap health benefits throughout our lives. Those verses that Carla read earlier from Mark's Gospel, when Jesus said we had to receive the kingdom of God as a child, Jesus isn't talking about age here. He's not saying we have to begin our faith journey with God when we're children or it's too late. That's not it at all. Jesus is talking about the openness that children have, the childlike trust and open-heartedness they have. That's what we need at every age to connect with God. That willingness to risk, to try, to trust, connect. That life tends to erode in us as we grow up. With God's help, we can be healed of those damages that we've experienced and become open-hearted once again. A lot of us adults have forgotten how to play. And if that's you, here's something you might want to try. Think backwards as far as you can go to your most joyful, playful memory. Whether it's with a toy 
or a pet, or on a birthday, or on vacation. And begin to build from that memory into how that connects you with joy now. Think of what delights you, what brings you joy, and then be out on the lookout for ways to add more of that into your life right now. Life is serious, but it's also meant to be enjoyed. Next Sunday at our Aloha Sunday celebration, we'll eat fun food like snow cones or Gunther's Freeze. Eating frozen treats is playful. We have fun together here at church. And the joy around here, it's from God. It's in us as a gift of God's Spirit. Of all the things that Jesus could have said to his followers after his resurrection, he deliberately chose to say this. Don't miss it. Jesus said, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. May this joy be present in us and flow out of us through laughter and play and be contagious in our world. Shall we pray? God, maybe there's a question floating around in our world these days. How can we play and be joyful in moments like these? To which your son responds, how can we not be joyful, especially in moments like these? To be with him is to train our gaze to see what's terrible, but also to see what's wonderful and beautiful around us. To pay attention to and focus on what we love. To practice tenderness and kindness as we work for justice. God, it's your joy that will make the lives that we want possible. Help us to play some and look for things that delight us every day. And remember that joy is possible even in the midst of difficulty. Amen. Mm -hmm.